on this Thursday night as the U.S. president takes his campaign style show on the road. Washington is gripped by a mystery. Who wrote it? That scathing New York Times op-ed from a secret White House insider. We'll look at the high profile scramble to deny it, the possible fallout from it, and all with the clock ticking to midterms, exactly two months away. Also tonight, the politics of pipelines, the protracted NAFTA process, and the state of the opposition, all of that is on the table. Well, good thing the At Issue gang is back for a new season with everyone around the table. It's almost as exciting as the first day of school. This is The National. To borrow a recent phrase, U.S. President Donald Trump is full of fire and fury, incensed over an anonymous claim that his presidency is being micromanaged behind his back. I mean, you look at this horrible thing that took place today, it's really, is it subversion? Is it treason? It's a horrible thing. Even, you know the good thing about that? Even liberals that hate me say, that's terrible what they did. And it is really terrible. But tonight, Trump was far from the source of the political drama in Washington. In Billings, Montana, at one of those big rallies that, as you know, he favors. And as you'd expect, that anonymous op-ed and the media were again top of his mind. But for all the energy that Trump drew from that event, he still got no answers to the big question that he has. Paul Hunter has more on that. Who wrote it? went the unanswered question to Donald Trump today, and what's more, who's in charge of the White House? Who's running the place? Who's the author of that column in yesterday's New York Times, credited to an anonymous senior White House official who labels Trump impetuous, ineffective, and amoral, reckless enough that so-called resistors in his inner circle now act behind his back for the good of the country? It was the question of the day. Did you write it? To the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley. No. To Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. It's not mine. CBC's Katie Simpson put it to Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Do you know who the author of the op-ed is? He didn't reply. Yes, there's even a Las Vegas odds-on favorite, Vice President Mike Pence, who today also denied he wrote it. Well, I think it's a disgrace. The Times today gave no hint about the author. This is The Daily. But its podcast, The Daily, interviewed editor James Dow, who communicated directly with the Trump insider. I would guess that this person has reached a breaking point. On whether Dow thinks the writer wants to comfort Americans by underlining some insiders are resisting Trump, or whether the op-ed is a call to action or even an atonement, that's a great question, and <laughs> I, I cannot answer definitively. Mm -hmm. My guess, it's a little bit of all those things. And yet, say some, the op-ed itself may change little in the minds of voters. This is an electorate that's really seen quite a lot already in terms of this administration. Uh, people's opinions about Trump are pretty much baked in in a positive or negative direction. Or, as a Republican senator put it today, despite all the public denials, a bigger issue might well be finding a Trump insider who couldn't write that op-ed. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. So, some other heavyweight names there, but others have also denied being the author, including Defense Secretary James Mattis, National Security Advisor John Bolton. But they are not alone. If there really is a so-called resistance movement at work in the highest levels of the administration, Nobody is admitting to being a member. The denials just keep coming. Dan Coats does not get along with Trump and is soon to leave his post as the director of national intelligence. But he says, no, it wasn't him, as does Trump's long-suffering attorney general. Despite months of public pot shots from the president, Jeff Sessions, too, denies writing it. Even First Lady Melania Trump has weighed in, condemning the author as a coward. Not that many people thought it was her behind it or anything, but it's notable that she spoke out. Well, somebody wrote this thing, and whether they want to cop to it or not, it's having a big impact right now, and who knows how widely its effects might actually reach. Let's get into that with Philip Bump. He's a national correspondent with The Washington Post. Good to see you, Philip. Um, I would imagine that the, the best game in, in Washington right now is trying to figure out who wrote this. Uh, are we any closer tonight to knowing that? 
No, I don't think so. I mean, we've had this spate of people who've come out and said that they did not write it, but that's exactly what the person who wrote it probably would say if asked. But there's this, <laughs> someone dug up today this great Wall Street Journal article from 1974 in which Deep Throat, Mark Felt, was asked, are you Deep Throat? And he said, no, I'm not. I made the Wall Street Journal. That's what's going to happen in this case, too. And, yeah. and I don't think we're any closer to finding out who actually did do it. So how is this, this act of resistance then being perceived in Washington? Is it being considered an honorable thing or, or, or quite the opposite? Well, it certainly is mixed, as with most things in Washington. But I would say the general consensus is that this person should have or should shortly identify themselves, identify what their position is, to answer some of the questions about, you know, what, what, how significant their role is, about what, uh, what, uh, who else they may have spoken with, how deep this resistance thing goes within the administration. Uh, there is a sense that by being anonymous, they sort of took an easier path forward than they might otherwise have done so. But uh, obviously, all of that sort of fades in the background compared with the question, first of all, of who it actually was, and then second of all, the significance of what was actually said and how deep this sentence goes within the administration. Okay, so, so what about the possible impact then of this? Obviously, you know, the president isn't going anywhere, but could there be a political price to pay in the midterms, for instance? Is this the kind of thing that would influence voters? I'm not terribly convinced that it will. I mean, this election for Trump's base, Trump's base, I think we talk about them all the time. Mm -hmm. They are certainly energized in support of President Trump. The question is whether or not they're actually going to translate that into to coming out in November. But what I think what this does do is it is the first time we have heard from someone in the administration, albeit we don't know who exactly it is, but we've heard from someone in the administration that all of the stories, all of the reporting is essentially true. That mm -hmm. Bob Woodward's new book, that those stories, if not true, in every single specific detail are broadly true about what it's like inside the White House. I think that that will help energize Trump's opponents and, more importantly, energize some independent independents who are a little wary about Trump's administration. Okay. Philip Bump, thanks for your perspective tonight. Appreciate it a lot. Of course. Still to come tonight on The National, celebrations across India after its Supreme Court strikes down a law that criminalizes gay sex. Could that cause other countries to change course? Plus, it's at issue night, a special supersized at issue just a few weeks before Parliament returns. That's coming up. Can't come soon enough, but first, things are tense between Russia and the West, even more so today, as Russia faced a barrage of criticism at the UN Security Council over the poisoning of that former Russian spy in England. As Thomas Daigle tells us, the United States is pressing Moscow to hand the suspects over. Something caught their eye. The two men accused of a chemical weapon attack, apparently checking out vintage coins through the window. This video, the first to show just how relaxed they looked on the streets of Salisbury. This is on the main route that goes to the railway station. It could be they were just killing time. Though what they were allegedly there for... The Security Council is called to order. <laughs> ...led to this, a UN Security Council meeting. We have clear evidence of Russian state involvement in what happened in Salisbury. And more denials from Moscow. Russia's ambassador called it a theater of the absurd. Britain claims officers from Russia's GRU intelligence agency carried out the attack with likely approval from the Kremlin. The GRU is a major intelligence service belonging to the military uh, that answers to the defense minister who answers to President Putin. So he is ultimately responsible for his actions of his government. Their case got the backing of Canada, the U.S., France and Germany, issuing a rare joint statement to say, we have full confidence in the British assessment. Why doesn't the Russian government turn these two murderers over to British authorities? Russia struggled to poke holes in the British case, pointing to these two images showing the suspects arriving at a London airport. The timestamps are identical. Russia sees that as image manipulation, except Britain says the men walked down different arrival halls. I don't know if the ambassador has been to Gatwick Airport. We have been to Gatwick Airport. There are multiple identical corridors through which people uh, can go. Investigators are said to be focusing on the suspects' bags and what they may have contained. This backpack isn't seen when they leave, and this suitcase appears out of nowhere. Authorities have built profiles of these two, but acknowledge there's still plenty left to learn. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London.
Staying overseas, a historic victory today for India's LGBT community after the country's top court overturned a ban on gay sex. <laughs> In city after city, scenes like this, laughter, cheering, hugging, the rain, no match for high spirits. In Mumbai, the celebration turned into an impromptu victory parade. Like the mood here, the Supreme Court's decision was unanimous, striking down the law that dates back more than 150 years. This was long due, and I'm really glad the Supreme Court finally gave us a legal recognition and made got us out from the category of criminals because there's nothing wrong about love. And that sentiment was very much reflected in the wording of the ruling. Take a look. They quoted Leonard Cohen from the ashes of the gay democracy is coming. And also from the 19th century German philosopher Goethe, I am what I am, so take me as I am. And as Ron Charles tells us, that celebratory spirit is spreading far and wide, reaching all the way here to people in Canada. Workers at this New Delhi hotel danced in celebration. The hotel's owner, Kashav Suri, is an LGBT activist who helped bring the case to court. Good, it's brilliant. And it's brilliant because finally we get a voice. That voice was heard around the world today. In Canada, it lit up Haran Vijayanathan's phone with messages from other members of the country's South Asian LGBT community. I know it's been a long fight, so to actually listen to the comments being made on Facebook and Twitter and, and, and watching some of the videos and, and the, just the jubilation of in, in Indians, uh, you know, across the world, um, it was really, really uh, heartwarming and nice. But he acknowledges now that the law is scrapped, there's still a lot of work to do to change attitudes. It's going to take maybe a few generations before we get India gets to where Canada is socially. But even again, like I said, Canada is not 100% there either. This award-winning series of documentaries chronicles how LGBT activists fought against India's gay sex law. The Canadian filmmaker says 150 years ago, India was the first of Britain's colonies to have the law imposed, but not the last. That law was um, carried in the valises of the various colonial administrators throughout the British Empire. Um, and all over the world today, there are active criminal court cases that are challenging uh, these laws. She expects courts in those other countries to refer to the Indian Supreme Court decision and hopes celebratory scenes like these eventually play out in former British colonies around the world. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. And that's an important point to pick up on because for many LGBT people around the world, the struggle for this kind of legal decision is very much ongoing. In 13 places, the punishment for same-sex sexual activity is death. In more than 70 others, homosexual acts are criminal acts. But in the last year, there have been some changes. Trinidad and Tobago's High Court is expected to rule this month on whether to decriminalize gay sex. When it comes to gay marriage, Australia legalized it last December. And just last month, Costa Rica ruled it should be made legal within the next year and a half. Big news from the world of international high fashion today. Burberry says it'll stop sending usable clothes and accessories to the incinerator simply because they can't sell them. That practice is actually common across the retail industry. But as Salima Shivji reports, the debate is on over luxury brand waste. A staple on the world's runways, Burberry had a major misstep this summer. Its annual report let slip that many unsold items were burned, more than $48 million worth, all to avoid them ending up severely marked down, thus weakening the brand. The backlash on social media was swift. Burberry shamed with the hashtag Burnberry and calls for a boycott. Today, an about face. Modern luxury means being socially and environmentally responsible, said the CEO. And so Burberry will no longer burn unsold products. Instead, we'll focus on recycling and donating them. The timing actually makes a heck of a lot of sense. Announcing at Fashion Week uh, where they're going to get maximum exposure and coincidentally not letting it drag out forever. At this showroom for Toronto Fashion Week, the news spread quickly. Because they're the first to do it, we're going to be cynical and be skeptical that they're just doing this as like a PR move. But 
I think as a whole, designers are more conscious of like what they're doing to the environment now. We deconstruct them and we make new pieces like this. Adam Taubenflegel shows off his denim line made of recycled jeans. He doesn't care what prompted Burberry's decision. If social media calling out irresponsible practices motivates you to make better changes, then that's fantastic. The problem is burning the clothes is easier and some government policies even reward it. If you are a retailer and you're importing garments to sell in Canada and you don't sell them for whatever reason, you will receive a credit on your next duty if you landfill or incinerate it. She says that needs to change, but so do shopping habits. High demand drives overproduction, leaving items stuck on shelves waiting to be burned. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Toronto. The fashion industry is actually the second largest polluter in the world after oil, and environmentalists have been quick to criticize Burberry. Yet that company is actually far from alone. The Swiss watchmaker behind Cartier and Mont Blanc has destroyed three quarters of a billion dollars worth of designer timepieces in the last two years. The company bought back unsold watches from jewelers to stop them from being sold at a discount. Meanwhile, H&M has been sending unwanted clothing to a Swedish power plant to be burned to create energy as an alternative to coal. The fast fashion retailer stressed it didn't incinerate any usable clothing, just products infested with mold or contaminated with lead. And we are live tracking a number of other developing stories tonight, including a manhunt underway in St. Catharines, Ontario, after three people were shot. We can tell you that uh, the full strength of the Niagara Region Police is involved right now. We're doing everything we can to resolve the situation safely for everybody involved. The shooting happened downtown at around 3.30 this afternoon. Of the three people shot, at least one is in critical condition, and police say there are two male suspects on the loose, maybe in their early 20s. As for motive, investigators say they believe it was targeted, but they've given no other details on how the shooters and victims are linked. Secret documents were released today at the confirmation hearing of U.S. Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. One of them, a draft op-ed from 2003 in which Kavanaugh said he's not sure Roe v. Wade is settled law because the Supreme Court could overrule it. When asked about it today, he described that landmark abortion case as important precedent, but that hasn't eased concern among critics. Kavanaugh was handpicked by Donald Trump, and Trump has strongly suggested he wants Roe v. Wade overturned. We think that this whole thing got blown up uh, beyond proportions. That's one of nearly 70 former New Democrat politicians openly criticizing federal leader Jagmeet Singh. They've signed a letter accusing him of making a mistake by refusing to let MP Aaron Weir back into federal caucus. Weir was expelled last spring over harassment allegations. He completed training and asked to return, but this week the party leader said he didn't think Weir would change his ways. So we're going to talk about all of that and more coming up because it's at issue night. A special double dose of Canada's favorite political panel is coming up. And charismatic, macho, charming, just some of the words being used to describe Burt Reynolds. Mourn his life and Hollywood legacy just ahead. Plus, TIFF has taken over downtown T.O., but new this year is Netflix taking over TIFF. Eli Glasser finds out what the streaming shakeup means for the film fest in the future. Netflix has been extraordinarily, wonderfully um, hands-off in terms of the creative process. They give you the money, they believe in you as artists, and they let you do your thing, and that was a glorious experience. Well, the stars are out on the red carpet tonight as the Toronto International Film Festival kicks off. And for the first time ever, a Netflix feature will open the festival. Now, Eli Glasner is there, and as he explains, it just goes to show you how streaming services are shaking up Hollywood. At first glance, this may look like a typical tip carpet. The glitz and the glam, the arrival of stars such as Chris Pine. But watch the trailer for Tiff's opening film, and you'll notice something new. The Outlaw King brought to you by Netflix. Netflix has been extraordinarily hands-off in terms of the creative process. They give you the money, they believe in you as artists, and they let you do your thing. 
Elma King is just one of eight Netflix films screening here at TIFF. It's part of a massive push by the streaming service. In 2018 alone, Netflix is spending $13 billion US on new content. Whether it's funding film festival fodder or the latest Michael Bay shoot 'em up, Netflix is giving traditional Hollywood studios a run for their money. They are counter programming. Uh, in terms of dollars um, for the level of story and the level of budget, but at the same time creating another tier, as you mentioned, with all of these big name, fabulous talents in order to compete head to head with the studios. And it's not just the big screen. With nominations for The Crown, Stranger Things, and more, Netflix beat out HBO at the Emmys this year, leading the pack with 112 nominations. In Canada, production companies are already benefiting from Netflix's commitment to fund $500 million in new productions. We've just changed history. I thought that would be a bigger deal. Travelers is a sci-fi series shot in Vancouver starring Eric McCormick. After the Showcase Network dropped the series, Netflix stepped in to fully fund the new season. Netflix has sort of become Hollywood's waiting room, that lobby. And you go in there, I've been in there, and George Clooney is sitting across from me, Seth Rogen, Jane Lynch, like, it's, it's staggering. So I think in that capacity, you realize what you're competing with. And you really have to sort of elevate your game. But with 125 million subscribers and growing, other companies are now rushing into the streaming space. Apple is spending a billion on original programming, signing deals with Oprah Winfrey and more. Amazon is premiering Homecoming, its new TV series starring Julia Roberts at TIFF, while Disney is launching its own Netflix rival next year. The convenience of watching what he wants, when he wants, is why Patrick O'Rourke is part of a growing generation who never paid for cable. But with monthly subscriptions to Crave, Netflix and more, he's already noticing the pressure on his pocketbook. I had a couple live TV services um, that I was accessing with a VPN that got very expensive um, and I decided that maybe I didn't really need those and I kind of cut those down. So I think I've already hit that point. As more and more Canadians subscribe to streaming services, they'll be facing the same conundrum, a growing universe of content with a monthly price to match. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on the national, NAFTA pipelines, a looming federal election, sort of. It's going to be a busy year in politics, and if I haven't talked about it enough and you don't know, our favourite gang is here to talk about all of this at Issue is Next. <laughs> Plus, Hollywood and Hollywood North are mourning Burt Reynolds tonight. There's a lot to say about his life and legacy, but first, have a listen to how some TIFF goers reacted to that news. He was a legendary artist, like some amazing movies. A lot of uh, a lot of guys looked up to him, and uh, he will definitely be missed for sure. Long as shard, though, Burt Reynolds was an icon, yeah. Yeah. and I'm very sad to hear yeah. that he's died. He was a character, and Hollywood loves characters, and he'll be loved, I'm sure, for for a time to come. House rose in late June and politicians quickly fled Ottawa for the land of photo ops and barbecues. The warm weather, though, didn't stop the government from announcing a summer cabinet shuffle. Some MPs became ministers and others were moved around. Skip ahead to early August, there was that tweet that set off a diplomatic spat with Saudi Arabia and all the retaliations that followed. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh announced he would be running in a yet-to-be-called by-election in Burnaby South. And then, just days before the start of the Conservative Party, convention, Maxime Bernier started tweeting about diversity again and again until he actually quit the party. This party is too intellectually and morally corrupt to be reformed. He is more interested in advancing his personal profile than advancing conservative principles. As if things weren't busy enough for the end of summer, throw President Trump in the mix. They used to call it NAFTA, we're going to call it the United States. Mexico trade agreement. That news of a U.S. and Mexico trade deal sent Canadian officials rushing down to Washington. There were a lot of meetings, but still no deal. And then a decision from the Federal Court of Appeals effectively halting the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion for now. That didn't sit well with the Alberta Premier. Until the federal government gets its act together, Alberta is pulling out of the federal climate plan. 
And that brings us to this week. Notley and Trudeau met to talk pipelines and the NAFTA talks. Well, they continue in Washington. No NAFTA is better than a bad NAFTA deal for Canadians, uh, and that's what we're going to stay with. So that's what happened while at issue was away. Just a few things, but we are back and we've got a few things to talk about. Thankfully, Andrew Coyne, Chantal Hébert, Shachi Curl, and Paul Wells are all here with me in studio in Toronto. Good to see everybody. I actually had forgotten there was a cabinet shuffle, so it was one of those <laughs> kinds of summers. Very busy. Uh, we're going to start with NAFTA because it's the issue that's still burning, bubbling, whatever along, and we still don't really know whether the government's going to be able to pull this off. So uh, I'll start with you, Andrew, on this one. Has the government managed this effectively so far? Is there anything else that they should or could be doing? It's hard to say they've managed it effectively. Uh, I think uh, Donald Trump and the views that he represents on alternate Wednesdays uh, would challenge anybody uh, and the, his mercurial personality, the people around him, all those things would be challenged to any government, any set of negotiations. But I think he would say it's not like much of what they've done has really helped matters. Uh, I, I think to bringing forward that progressive social agenda, for example, as if mm. that was ever going to have any useful part of these negotiations. Talk about women and indigenous people. It, it, and, lovely ideas, yeah. but it just was not practical in, in these talks. Uh, I think they've been firmer on some issues that I wish they would uh, yield on. Certainly the retaliatory tariffs, I would say, have, have not uh, served interest well. You can debate how well they've managed Trump himself. All that being said, um, we don't know what's going to happen. And if they do manage to pull out of the fire some kind of agreement that is not awful, and I think that's the best we can hope for, is not awful, mm. um, then, uh, then they'll look better than they do right now. The we don't know, I think, is the operative uh, sentence. And it's really hard to uh, analyze how we get to somewhere when we don't know if it's nowhere or somewhere, yeah. or what is the preferred course. I have yet to uh, meet anyone, and there are many qualified people who have spoken about this file, who uh, have offered me any indication that they could have done a lot better. Yeah. And I give the government credit for so far having managed to uh, not have Canada negotiate with Canada as it negotiates with the United States. Right. And right. that's an operation that is not easy over when, when President Trump sent that notice to Congress about the Mexico-U.S. deal on Friday, he got a lot of pushback from unions, yeah. from the Chamber of Commerce, from people in Congress. Justin Trudeau did not get a lot of pushback in this country, and he briefed just about everyone. There are lots of people he briefed, Premier of Ontario to name just one, mm -hmm. who have no reason to do anything nice to him. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think you have to give the government credit for that. I mean, Andrew Scheer sort of veered into that last week. I don't know how successful it was, but yeah. Yeah, yeah but since the Prime Minister briefed yes. uh, the Premiers... Nothing else. It has been radio silence to the despair of some of us who thought they had good sources. So, <laughs> so that's right. That is true, actually. So what about, though, that moment where uh, Christia Freeland finds herself in Europe doing various speeches, finds out there's a, an agreement or at least a handshake deal between Mexico and the U.S. and has to rush back? Is that an indication that, that they weren't, I don't know, that they weren't aware that it was that close? Or what does that tell us, if anything? She's been on the file for a year and a half. I mean, there's days when she's going to be uh, somewhere besides that that reporter's alley in Washington. <laughs> and having to hop on a flight is not the worst. Uh, Shachi and I did it today, and it didn't kill us. <laughs> um, 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 the, we know this much. Donald Trump campaigned for the presidency, repeatedly calling NAFTA the worst deal in history. He didn't even say the worst trade deal. I mean, it was worse than, <laughs> it was worse apparently than all the hockey trades in history. Uh, and and uh, a year and a half later, um, NAFTA is still the, 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 the rule set by which trade is governed across North America. Um, Churchill said there's nothing more exhilarating than to be shot at without result. It's not entirely exhilarating because we're still getting shot at. There's still some chance that the next bullet will hit and then, mm -hmm. you know, this president who's in, the, who's in the worst crisis week of his presidency will decide that he needs to cancel NAFTA uh, to change the channel. I mean, that, that's still a possibility. But for a year and a half, that trade deal has remained in place. It's not nothing. So as I think about the next 13, 14 months yeah. and how all of this then plays out in front of the electorate, uh, in many ways, uh, notwithstanding maybe a foreign minister being, being perceived to be 
caught off guard. Look at what's happened in Washington in the last week. Every time we think that the White House has punched its ticket to crazy town, it takes a detour to crazier town. All of that bodes very well for the prime minister. Uh, for him, at the end of the day, I suspect that selling this deal may be more important to Canadians and the way he sells it than the actual substance of it. We gave on this, we mm -hmm. got on that. That will end up being taking a backseat to being able to say, I fought Trump. I stood up to him, I demonstrated that yeah. I was swinging for the fences, and on things like dispute resolution, when he says, uh, look, uh, we can't trust Trump, therefore we need these things, we need that red line, that is a resonant message. But if there's, if the reason that we keep NAFTA is because some, somebody took a piece of paper off the president's desk when he wanted to rip it up, I mean, how much credit then can you take? Well, but but that, that is like saying, uh, should we also feel guilty because the president is uh, acting irrationally <laughs> As, we we have a government that yeah. is uh, negotiating with people who are not we can't vouch that they're seriously negotiating much of anything and who are in a crisis mm -hmm. it's their crisis not ours yeah, yeah. and we're in a relatively we, we have, to have to remind ourselves we're in a relatively strong position in a couple ways one is uh, that Trump himself uh, cannot simply wave a no. tap his fingers no. and cancel. It's not all go through the yeah. Congress. So yeah. We've got power in Washington. Secondly, you know, we traded with the Americans for 120 years with, before there was a free trade agreement. We would still trade with them after a NAFTA. Uh, we just wouldn't trade as efficient. Yeah. Uh, so it's not the end of the world, even if even if the worst case happens and NAFTA gets gets torn up, we would still survive as a country. Okay, I want I want to switch gears before I run out of time to pipelines because that was the other part of what I think everyone was agreed was uh, was a bad week for the Trudeau government. I'm not sure it was the worst week, but certainly a very challenging one. What what do they do next here, Paul? Because they have not only a lot of money, our money, riding on this, but a lot of political capital, too. And they do seem to be, I don't know, stuck for now, anyway. Yeah. Well, as regards the court decision that was so upsetting for them, they've got a few options, and there's actually nothing to stop them from pursuing every option at once. They can appeal to the Supreme Court. They can come up with a sort of legislative patch to try and, 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 and kick the, the approval process forward. And they can... Uh, throw together uh, an expedited but slightly more serious consultation and environmental assessment process. And, and as I say, they can do all of those at once. That's a good point. Um, yeah. um, but in the meantime, this grand uh, bargain that was at the center of, of the Trudeau uh, political offer in 2015, we can do energy exports and the environment, we can be better at both, uh, and, and, and there, there don't have to be any losers. It's, it's starting to look like uh, that's not the case, that, uh, that people who are against pipelines don't become, uh, you know, don't accept that you cancel two pipelines mm -hmm. and then pass mm -hmm. a, a third. And the coalition against uh, serious climate change, act, change action is growing. Or, or it's just much harder to do than they expected. Yeah, well, but you could argue that in the case of the grand bargain, it was already in trouble before that court ruling on Trans Mountain with the BC government that doesn't want the pipeline and uh, yes, an Ontario government that doesn't want well, the carbon, carbon pricing. Yeah. So w once you've got those two big pieces, and they're not small, uh, you, you can't say this court uh, decision suddenly is making it unravel. I understand Alberta's decision to say, uh, if this isn't going to work out, we're yeah. going to pull out, but it has no impact. The, no. the real test of this in Alberta is the Alberta election. Uh, and everyone's known that for months. now. Paul is right, they can do all these things at the same time, but what they can't do is find a magic solution that will, you know, wave a magic wand and this problem will go away. And you, you read a lot of that, it does not exist. I'd be wary of going to the Supreme Court because if the Supreme Court refuses to hear the appeal, that basically says what was said in, in federal court stands. And I would bet dollars and donuts they would uphold it. I, I, yeah. You know, if you read that ruling, it's absolutely couched in language of previous Supreme Court rules. Yes. It seems to me highly unlikely the court would see differently, but you never know. Uh, look, this was in trouble. The grand bargain was in trouble before this court ruling. The court ruling arguably, you know, makes things better for them at, by emphasizing the rule of law and keeping everybody sort of within so, that. And suggesting solutions. Yeah, yeah. It's, so exactly. I don't think it's the setback that some people have said, but the grand bargain required that you handle each side of that bargain extremely well. Uh, and I, I won't, I wouldn't say that they've handled either the pipeline or the carbon pricing, uh, uh, the politics of either of those terribly well. Okay, last case. word to you, then I'll take Particularly a break. on the issue of trying to keep that pipeline completion on track, you know, that, that ruling very clearly gets back to the heart of the matter, which is a lack of consultation 
on tankers. And when you talk about a path to yes, when you talk about how to get those people, who, there's always going to be a core that's opposed no matter what. But when you look at British Columbia, when you look at the rest of the country, when you say, you know what, if they could find a better way to reassure people on the issue of tankers off the West yep. Coast, there is a real coming down in temperature in terms of the heat of that opposition. And I've said this all along, it is a tanker issue. So look, today we hear that that uh, boost to funding on spill response off the coast of BC is on hold. If I was government, I wouldn't do that. I'd, I'd go ahead and say, Increasing look, we're energy. demonstrating yeah. what we need to do to get to a yes on that. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. Andrew, Chantal, Shachi, and Paul will be back for another round of that issue. We're going to check in with the other parties. Stick around. We certainly are one big, strong, united, national conservative party. I intend to run in the upcoming by-election here in Burnaby South. How is the Conservative Party and the NDP doing after the summer break? What are their upcoming hurdles? There's a few of them. That's next on At Issue. Welcome back to our supersized at issue. Andrew Chantal, Shachi, and Paul, all with me this evening in Toronto. We've been talking about how the Liberals have been doing. Now let's talk about the other guys, the Conservatives and the NDP. So we're going to break it down uh, between the four of you. Paul, let's start with uh, what has been an unusual summer for the Conservatives, uh, I think largely because of Maxime Bernier. Yeah. Uh, has that damage them in any way uh, that we maybe don't see or or is it sort of unknown at this point? I think it has reinforced a little bit of grumbling to the effect among conservatives that Andrew Scheer is not running a real conservative party. A little bit like what we heard in Ontario for Patrick Brown mm -hmm. before he got hoisted out of the, that job. Um, um, in practical uh, terms, it probably isn't going to make much uh, effect at all. The, 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 the fundraising numbers that Maxime Bernier is bragging about are trivial compared to the Conservatives, which are the biggest fundraising party in the country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he, he had a... Um, he, he drummed up a spokesperson who, who said on his behalf that they, were, they might be able to pull away, away as many as three MPs from the Conservative caucus. First of all... I'll believe it when it happens. Secondly, <laughs> three's not a large number. No. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's a distraction on the scale of Belinda Stronach when she left Stephen Harper's Conservative Party uh, before he became Prime Minister. So what, so what is the state of that party then heading into the fall? Because we are about, you know, about a year out now. Well, it's going to depend. I mean, uh, uh, it's an odd enterprise that, that Bernier has set up. I mean, usually when new parties start up, it's because you have a number of people of like mind, you have a compelling... Um, issue or agenda, you have a crisis point where this like has to... Like the block to, we talked about. Or, this has to, yeah. or the reform party. And or you have some uh, monumental leader who everyone just follows around. Okay. Uh, at this point, it's not clear that there's any of that involved <laughs> here. Uh, it, it does appear at this point as being essentially a personality vehicle for Maxime Bernier. Uh, and he's going to have to show in the weeks to come that it's something more than that, that they have actual policies, that they are able to raise funds, that they have candidates and supporters. Mm. And so far, the jury is very out. If, if they're able to produce all that, I wouldn't necessarily underestimate them because we're even seeing already in the polls some, some at least um, curiosity about mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. higher numbers than I expected, to be frank on that. Really? But don't so, also forget the, the X factor here, or the max factor, which is angry conservatives. There's always been about a third of the base. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to go anywhere, but bristled under Stephen Harper for all those years, yeah. wanting to see the party go yeah. more to the right, and, you know, we might see a boil over. You can't underestimate no, that. No, but Andrew Shear is no Stephen Harper, as, as I no. think you've all pointed out in various and columns. Of yeah. those angry uh, conservatives are in the West, where the conservatives can afford to lose votes. Yeah, um, NDP, Jagmeet Singh. Where if, it doesn't seem like it's been a particularly good summer for him. To th uh, no, with a, a lot of popular incumbents announcing yeah. already that yeah. they're, they're not running again when he would sorely need them, and the impression that he's not getting through. Two things: if there were a leadership review vote this fall, I believe he would lose it. And the dominant feeling that I've picked up, it's high in Quebec, but not yes. only there. It's not buyer's remorse, it's seller's remorse over yes. having let go Thomas mm -hmm. Mulcair at a time when the Liberals are so vulnerable on I... their handling of the oh, uh, He's going to send you an email tonight. Oh, he was walking on a cloud. I've seen him this way. The, the, the interview the other day. Uh, you Democrats, I tried to stop you from dumping Mulcair, but you never listened. <laughs> 
Chachi, what do you make of where the NDP is? All is not lost. Let's just remember we have we have written off politicians in the past and they live at, to, to see another day. But let's let's be real. Look, this has not <laughs> been a good rookie right. year for Jagmeet Singh. <laughs> no. Uh, look, the, the hand wringing about what if he loses this by-election in Burnaby, I don't think that's going to happen. That is as solid a uh, an orange, I was about to say red, an orange <laughs> seat as I've seen. It used to be part of Sven Robinson's writing. Peter Julian had part of it for a long time. I don't see him losing it. What happens after, though? He has been out jugmeted by Justin Trudeau. He is the, the, the left flank of the party has been so squeezed. They pulled that pharmacare uh, piece out of the playbook. And so where does he go? How does he distinguish himself? And what is his articulated message on pipelines? These become the issues if he pulls it out. You have five seconds on check me. Uh, usually when a party leaves in trouble, you can, you can sort of get MPs to talk about it reluctantly. These times, they'll take you aside. They'll, they'll grab you and say, I want to tell you about my feelings about Jagmeet yes. Singh. They ask you for dinner, OK? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We kicked off at issue in style. I appreciate it. Good news for all of you who love politics as much as we do. This is also a podcast, so if you want to hear all these smart people again, be sure to subscribe. You'll get extra content. And of course, the main podcast in, in podcast form every week. iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. I'm so happy they're back. Still ahead on the national, our moment of the day, a bear in Byward. Perhaps he was shopping for the bear necessities, but really all this wildlife loose in Ottawa is becoming unbearable. Oh, more detail, fewer puns next. First though, a man who was a giant in Hollywood has died. You know, there's this cliched phrase, which sounds almost comical now. Women want him and men want to be him. Well, Burt Reynolds kind of was him, that guy, the quintessential old school movie star. Tonight, we look at his career and his legacy. <laughs> what could go wrong? Burt Reynolds. That name was once basically a license to print money. He had his good looks, easy humor, and natural charisma. <laughs> For a time, Burt Reynolds was the biggest star in the world. Action movies, gritty dramas, slapstick comedy. Yeah. He did it all, though it took a while for things to get going. But 1972's groundbreaking survival thriller, Deliverance, changed everything. You don't beat it. You don't beat this river. Reynolds became a huge star, and a string of hits followed, including two that became popular franchises, Smokey and the Bandit and The Cannonball Run. They cemented his reputation as a carefree celebrity playboy, larger than life, even becoming one of Norm Macdonald's signature characters on SNL years later. Burt Reynolds, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, sorry I'm late. I uh, had to pick up my podium from the, from the grass. It was during a high point in his career Reynolds met the woman he called the love of his life, but was destined to lose, Sally Field. I don't know. It was love at first sight. I mean, as soon as we got in the car, Where are we going? I thought, no, don't tell me. Let me guess. This, this little girl is for me. Hollywood changed by the late 80s, and his star began to fade. But in 1997, he took a chance on an independent film about the glory days of L.A.'s adult film industry, Boogie Nights. Yep. Jack Warner, filmmaker. Really? Yeah. It almost single-handedly resurrected his career, earning him a Golden Globe, an Oscar nomination, and thrusting him back into the limelight for another two decades. Burt Reynolds died today in hospital in Jupiter, Florida, he was 82. Welcome back. Tonight on The National, concern is growing in Syria over how far the government will go to regain control of Idlib province, the country's last major rebel stronghold. Today, the U.S. representative for Syria said there's, quote, lots of evidence that chemical weapons are being prepared in the region. The U.N. has warned of a potential bloodbath if there's an all-out assault. In Japan today, lots of work to be done. Crews are sifting through rubble, searching for survivors after yesterday's 6.6 .6 magnitude quake and landslide on the island of Hokkaido. At least nine people are confirmed dead and about 30 others are still missing. And right-wing conspiracy theorist Alex Jones has been banned from Twitter. The account for his website, Infowars, has also been shut down. 
Twitter says it made the move after a series of tweets yesterday that were abusive and broke the rules, but it wouldn't say which tweets in particular were the worst offenders. Now, as the nation's capital, Ottawa is always full of hungry political animals, myself included, but lately it's been having actually quite a time with actual wildlife. This is perhaps not surprising. Ottawa is a very green city along a mighty river, close to wilderness, but even by those standards, things are getting a little out of hand in tonight's moment. There was the bird's nest that delayed the setup of a music festival. They couldn't get the stage and the equipment in until they got it out. Then a moose was on the loose on a highway in the middle of the city. For those who've never seen a moose, well, they're a handful. But today, a new one, a large black bear shut down Ottawa's popular byword market. It was spotted at around 3 a.m. And before long, a police perimeter was set up, but they couldn't find it again for a while. Then there it was, hanging out in a tree behind a restaurant and acting pretty chill, actually, leading to a long stalemate until police tranquilized it so they could set him loose so everybody wins, even him. He got a name out of the deal, the byword bear. Now, I'm not saying it's the reason I left Ottawa this morning, but as I left Ottawa <laughs> this morning, I did see all this kerfuffle in, in the market. And what was right. remarkable to me was the number of people who had left their homes to go watch this unfold. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, if I was there, I would have been shocked. I mean, as you know, I was born and raised in Ottawa, spent 20 years there. I've, I've never seen a bear in the Byward market. And, and thank goodness for that, too, because I, I, I can never remember what the right advice is. Like, like for black bears, you... Yeah. You, you play dead or you don't play dead or it's grizzly bears you play dead or you, you do... Anyways, it's one of the two. I feel two, like and... you're not going to live as long as me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I moved away 10 plus years ago and I, I guess there I dodged go. a bullet. <laughs> uh, that's the national for this Thursday, September 6th. Have a great night. Night. <laughs>